Chapters 15 and 16 principally concerned the corruption of the army and the unstable military rule that almost killed the Roman Empire. The army itself was installing and dispatching emperors at quite a pace. But at the end of chapter 16, we discover that this decline was arrested by the Illyrian generals. We can be excused for thinking that this would be the change of state that Montesquieu would begin to discuss in chapter 17 but it is not. In fact, it is not all that easy to identify the change in state that Montesquieu discusses in chapter 17. Montesquieu mentions several changes. First, the rise of another kind of tyranny. Second, the rise of the desire to be worshipped like the king of Persia brought about by the reforms of Diocletian, perhaps. Third, the establishment of the new city of Constantinople, and the attendant division of the empire and other changes attendant to that. And fourth, the restationing of the legions from the banks of the great rivers and the borders of the empire to the provinces. Montesquieu has to go out of his way not to mention Christianity in this chapter, though he blames most of these changes on the blundering Constantine, as he sees it, the emperor most responsible for Christianizing the empire. We need to understand these changes and the charges against Constantine. Let us look at the first one, the rise of another kind of tyranny. You could create two columns, the first concerning the old kind of tyranny, and the second, the new kind of tyranny. The old kind of tyrant massacred people, conceived of evil actions, acted with impetuosity, loved pleasures, made many appearances before the military was sometimes quite affable, and was also quite open. We will call these the vices of a tyrannical pagan. The new form of tyranny rendered iniquitous judgments in the form of justice. It seemed to set aside and dishonor life. It was governed by artifice and more exquisite arts. It had the vices of feeble souls. It loved indolence and idleness and its emperors were isolated from the people and the court, and governed only through a few confidants. Montesquieu mentions no examples of this other kind or new kind of tyranny. It just sits out there in the abstract way. It is difficult to know precisely what this new kind of tyranny is, without any examples of it, of course. And I cannot quite be sure he has in mind um, from what follows. It doesn't resemble anything that I know of in the Roman Empire in the aftermath of this period. What Montesquieu says next seems to illuminate the nature of this different kind of tyranny. Because after describing this new kind of tyranny, Montesquieu discusses how Diocletian and perhaps others brought the ways of Persia into the Roman Empire. They brought Asiatic ostentation and pomp with them. And this quick description is revealing, most for what it does not say, because it skips right from Diocletian to Julian. Julian is known as the apostate, the apostate that is from Christianity. And the great ruler that arises between Diocletian and Julian is, of course, Constantine the Great. Let us take a look at these two short paragraphs on the rise of Persian religion within Rome. Uh, as a way of understanding what's going on. Quote, The sojourn of several emperors in Asia and they, their perpetual rivalry with the king of Persia imbued them with the desire to be worshipped like the latter. And Diocletian, others say Galerius, ordered it by an edict. As this Asiatic ostentation and pomp was being established, people grew quickly accustomed to it. And when Julian wanted to invest his manners with simplicity and modesty, what was only reminiscent of the old morals was called neglect of his dignity. Nothing here is said about Diocletian's persecution of the Christians, a staple of his imperial rule. In fact, this is a very strange thing because Diocletian seems to have persecuted the Christians at Galerius's behest. There really is a historical dispute about who is responsible for the edict for persecuting Christianity. 
because this edict was given by Diocletian, but, many say, that Galerius, his subordinate, prodded him into it through a kind of Reichstag fire staging. It is even not clear what edict Montesquieu is referring to. He might be referring to Diocletian's declaration that he was a god, and that people must prostrate themselves before him and kiss his robe when in his presence. Regardless, Montesquieu has already established earlier that the Asiatic practices prepared the way for Christianity when he talked about Algolopolis Al- Al- in chapter 16. How did the people quickly grow accustomed to Asiatic ostentation and pomp? That was the conversion of the empire spearheaded by Constantine. The old pagan ways were no longer supported by the state under Constantine. Much by way of advancement within the empire depended on one's profession of Christian faith, and more. It seems that Montesquieu is making a very Machiavellian critique of Christianity, namely that it deprives people of the ability to fight and the interest in fighting, and it promotes an otherworldly indolence. Remember, this new kind of tyranny dishonors life, promotes feeble souls, and detracts from the emperor's affability. The lazy ways of fighting, characteristic of the Asians or Persians that Rome had been fighting for a long time, now made its way into the head of the Roman army, or so Montesquieu claims. Earlier in chapter 15, on page 136 and 37, Montesquieu linked the gentler manners of modernity to its more repressive religion, that is, to Christianity. The Christian emperor represents this new kind of tyranny, so it seems. This supposed critique of Christianity also might explain the new maxims adopted by the Romans as they are described in chapter 18. Earlier, the Romans did not care about justice and would divide and conquer their enemies with a ruthless persistence, as we saw in chapter 6, entitled, On the Conduct the Romans Pursued to subjugate all people. Under the new maxims described in chapter 18, the Romans sought to buy peace with their enemies. They depended upon auxiliary soldiers and barbarians to wage war, and they thereby lost military discipline and abandoned their own arms. They came to depend on cavalry and not infantry. They lost not only the art of war, but also their prudence and wisdom and constancy and their love of glory and their love of country. When this corruption entered the military itself, the Romans became, as Montesquieu says, pray for all people. It is in this context that Montesquieu offers his greatest defense of the sociological view of human life, that is, the view that man is determined by what is around him. It is not chance that rules the world. Ask the Romans, who had a continuous sequence of successes when they were guided by a certain plan, and an uninterrupted sequence of reverses when they followed another. There are general causes, moral and physical, which act in every monarchy, elevating it, maintaining it, or holding it to the ground, hurling it to the ground. All accidents are controlled by these causes. In a word, the main trend draws with it all particular accidents. It seems to me that Montesquieu is seeking to lay much of the blame for the decline of Rome at the feet of Christianity, or at least to criticize the Christian effect on politics generally, if not in the case of Rome. That is, what Montesquieu is doing is trying to establish the grounds for rejecting St. Augustine's common-sense treatment of the conflict between paganism and Christianity. St. Augustine held that Rome was in decline long before Christianity arrived on the scene. Much that Montesquieu says in considerations as a whole actually supports St. Augustine's view, as we have seen. Though, unlike St. Augustine, I think Montesquieu's point is that there are political sources for this decline, and he does not trace it to paganism. Here, Montesquieu is seeking to show that Christianity has generally not been politically advantageous. If that did not apply to the Romans, then it does apply to Montesquieu's own day. 
he certainly tries to bring Constantine down more than a few notches. I doubt that Montesquieu would consider Constantine the Great all that great. He says that he built up Constantinople out of vanity in chapter 17. He says that Constantine was just plain stupid to have continued the grain dole as he built up that island city. It was an island and became an island in the way Athens was an island during the Peloponnesian War. It is not clear that Constantine could have supplied a city with grain without the dole, given the nature of its topography and later its walls. Montesquieu blames Constantine for many of the reforms about how the Roman borders were defended that were actually initiated before Constantine and to pretty great effect for a while. All the while he is criticizing Mon uh, Constantine, Montesquieu is praising Julian the Apostate, the last anti-Christian emperor, for his wisdom, constancy, economy, conduct, bravery, and his series of heroic actions. Julian lived less than two years as a ruler. He didn't have the time to be as great as Montesquieu claims. I conclude from all this that Montesquieu is criticizing Christianity, not for the damage it did through Constantine and his successors to the Roman Empire. My guess is that Montesquieu is criticizing it for the damage it does in his own day, as he understands it. Montesquieu will raise this exact issue at the beginning of chapter 19, to which we will turn in the next video.